story is told, and I tried to verify this story, so that's really why I'm saying the story is told, okay? I, I, I heard this story years ago, and I could not find anything. I did all the research I could, okay? So I'm just throwing that out there that this may just be a story, a fable, but, we're good, but here's, here's the story. A famous world traveler is interviewed. This is a few, few years about, ago. This is late 1800s, supposedly. And, and as he's interviewed, one of the questions they ask him, one of the first questions, out of all the places you've been, the things you've seen, I mean, he's been around the world multiple times. He's been to all these hundreds of countries and cities. What is, if you had to pick, the greatest sight you've ever seen, what would you pick? Here's what he said. That he was on a train traveling from the United States across the border into Canada. And they make their way across into Canada, and there's a whole group of passengers on this, in this train car. And when they stopped on the other side, the Canadian border, he said he watched as one man hopped off the train. And he got a little ways away from everyone else, out into the, the field, and he falls down on his knees in the dirt. Reaches down, as he reaches down, he grabs clumps of dirt, of dust, and throws them up in the air. And as he does so, he cries, Freedom! 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 See, this man was a slave. And due to the difference in boundaries and laws, he was now free. Freedom. You don't have to have been a, a literal slave like that or have, have lived under some extreme tyranny to feel the excitement, the relief, sheer joy of being set free. And so this morning, that is our word. Freedom. If you were to come back tonight, we have another one-word sermon with an exclamation mark. Danger. And it's actually what I planned to preach last Sunday night. And there's some irony there, okay? And we'll address that more this evening, Lord willing. But let's think together this morning about freedom. Freedom. Here's three thoughts for your time today. Question. Are you free? Are you free? Then the declaration, Jesus sets free. And then more of an observation or a realization of what it means to be free, being free. Let's take a look at that first question together this morning. Are you free? This is where we pipe up. And we say, well, we live in the United States of America and we don't have slavery like that man experienced anymore and we've moved past that, at least in the sense that's not happening. We're all free. We have the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and that's even there have been some amendments made. We're free people. What are we? Here's another question. What dominates my life? For the sake of sermon, it's what dominates your life, my life. I think about that time that Paul referred to being mastered or dominated by something. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, if you want to look at it sometime. But really this morning, I'm just borrowing his language out of that context, to ask, am I mastered or dominated by anything in life? Now, now we could say, okay, I'm mastered by the master, by Jesus, but that's not the question here. It's aside from that, is there anything in your life that controls you? 
That might be a person. That might be your job. And that might be that you feel like you're enslaved to the job. It it might be money. It, It might be more than money. It might be what money can buy. The nice things in life that tend to master us. Things that perhaps we should master, we should have control over, and yes, enjoy in our lives to some extent or another, they can master us, can't they? And there's that whole, you know, the the, the hunter becomes the prey, the, the master becomes the slave. And the very thing that we thought we have control over, we think we have under control, is the very thing that controls us. Let's turn in our Bibles now to Galatians chapter 4. As we ask, am I, are we enslaved, are we free, what dominates us? Galatians chapter 4, verses 7, or 8 and 9. In this previous paragraph, the first seven verses of Galatians, Paul is reminding the Christians here, reminding us as Christians today, if we are a Christian, that we have been adopted as sons into God's family. We're not slaves from that perspective. We've been set free. For for them, some of them have been set free now from the law. All of them set free from sin. So he writes this to them, and it might just be a good wake-up call for us today about freedom. Galatians 4, 8 and 9. He says, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. For them, this would include the more direct, obvious worship of idols and sacrificing in an idolatrous temple. For us, our idols don't look the same. We've had some recent discussions in the the adult class over here in the fellowship hall about our idols today, our modern idols. And that really fits here as well with the question, what dominates? You could say, what is my idol? What do I worship and serve like a god in my life? And it might not be that I bow down to a statue. It might be that I bow down to portfolio. Or that the temple isn't an actual temple that looks like a place where worship happens. It might be a different building that I like to go to and engage in activities. Let's keep reading. He said, that was who you were. Now, verse 9, that you have come to know God, not just about God, see that, but to know God. This is the knowing where I know and I am known. I know God, He knows me, it's reciprocal. It says you can come to know God, or rather to be known by God. Question, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world? whose slaves you want to be once more? What dominates my life? If you keep reading in verses 10 and 11, you get the specific problem for them. And Paul's saying that for non-Jews to go back to the Mosaic law like this, is, it's just like going back to idolatry. It's going back to this system that Paul calls bondage. What dominates your life? Now let's turn together to John chapter 8. It's possible to be enslaved and it be unknown. You give people enough security, enough safety, on a civil level, And they might not realize, some of them at least might not even know, if you would approach them on the street and ask them, that they're living under a a very tyrannical government. 
They feel like everything's okay. As long as they've got some security and some safety and maybe a, enough food and shelter to get by and that's taken care of, they're good. I wonder about us. We might, again, pipe up and say, we're free because we're citizens of the United States. Or we might say, we're free spiritually because we're in a church building on a Sunday morning. Of course I'm free as a, as a Christian. I, I might not even be a Christian yet, but I'm associated with some kind of church, and I think, okay, that's enough. Or I'm a Christian, and that's all that my Christianity really comes down to is I go to church. Let's read about some similar individuals. In John chapter 8, and I hit the wrong button. I went too far. Okay. All right. John chapter 8, verses 33 and following. This is after Jesus has mentioned the possibility of being set free in John 8, 31 and 32. And in verse 33, they answer, we are offspring of Abraham and have never, never, they say, been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Sound familiar? We're free. I, I'm a citizen. I'm a church member. I'm free. I think they might have forgotten about 400 plus years of Egyptian slavery in their ancestry that led to them being the true children of Abraham as Israel. They also just maybe forgot about the Babylonians, really the Assyrians. I mean, we could go back further to the Amorites and others. They, they, they might have forgot about the Greeks. They might have forgotten about the Romans. They were living under a, a semi-slavery now. They were at least under military occupation. And they, in a different setting, so desperately wanted to be free from that. But Jesus starts talking about something, a different kind of, of freedom, of liberty here, and they, they're shocked. It might be the worst kind of slavery ever to think you are as free, and this might be trite, but as free as can be, but you're really enslaved. And whether that is that job, that paycheck, that bank account, the pornography, the sex itself, whatever it is. And we could talk numbers. We could talk statistics in churches. There are multiple epidemics of people who are enslaved, addicted to sexual things, alcohol, narcotics, some of them they get at, we get at the pharmacy. Maybe we should be careful before we are too quick to say, yes, I'm free. Are you free? Are you free? But here is the good news this morning. And if, if you were watching the screen, kind of ruined that whole transition there, but too bad. Jesus can set us free. Jesus sets free. The shackles of sin, of Satan, of the law for the Jews, the shackles of this strict rule-keeping focus that some people have, the shackles of death in the long run are gone. Someone wrote that his nails that pinned him to the cross are like the key to my shackles. And that who he is and what he has done can set us free. If you're still in John chapter 8, let's go back now to John chapter 8, verse 31, and read what Jesus said that caused the reaction in the previous verses we read. John chapter 8, verse 31 it says, so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus spoke to the people 
who are in attendance in Elk City at Second and Adams, who are likely here because they have some belief in Jesus. He said to them, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Truth will release you. And as we studied a few weeks ago, when you really break it down, Jesus is, in His own words elsewhere, Jesus is the truth. He's the embodiment of truth. So read it that way. You stay with my words, Jesus' words. You'll be Jesus' real, authentic disciples, not just churchgoers with a pretense. And then you will know Jesus, and Jesus will set you free. There's something about those words. You're free to go. I think about someone just this past week who was ready to be free to go from a hospital bed. Or I think about leaving your job. I was told that, that I, I could use this as an illustration. She didn't say I could, so I don't know. But Parla, all right, she may feel kind of free now, all right? Now, there's a bittersweetness to the whole retirement thing. Maybe Alan, too, I don't know. Alan may feel the opposite, but I better just keep going, okay, before I get myself in too much trouble here. We are having a party for y'all today, okay? When you hear those words, you're free to go. It could be a military discharge that last time. You say, Do, is there anything else? Do I need to sign anything else? And they say, no, you're free to go. Or it's the airport security. And you, you get all your stuff through, and maybe they, hopefully they don't have to do anything extra. You just stand there, and the x-ray, and then you, they say, what? They might even say, you're free to go. Or to take it up a whole other level. It's when you stand there, and they bring out that plastic bag, I'm not speaking from personal experience, but they bring out the plastic bag and they set it on the desk and you change out of the prison orange or whatever you're wearing back into whatever somebody brought you or what you wore the day you got there. And then you hear the words, you're free to go. You see, the whole other level beyond all of that it is when Jesus' blood, when Jesus, in, in, a, in a figurative sense from the cross, says to me as I'm buried in baptism and raised in newness of life, Paul says it this way, I'm set free from sin. And then it's like he says, you're free to go. Let's look at it. Romans chapter 8. Jesus sets us free, and here's two examples, and there's some comparison passages there in John chapter 1 for some further reading on your own time. But in Romans chapter 8, we were reminded that Jesus sets us free from sin. Here's two examples of what Jesus sets us free from for this, time, this study. Romans chapter 8, which is 1 through 4. I thought I had that one marked, and so it went back to Galatians 4, and that threw me for a second there. Romans chapter 8, 1 through 4. This is after Paul's lengthy discussion about sin and what it does to our relationship with God. This is after he discussed in chapter 6 where we are immersed into Jesus, baptized into his death, and then we are free to live for righteousness. And here is this after that then. There is, therefore, now, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For, look at it, verse 2, the law of the Spirit of life has done what? Has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Without Jesus, it is you sin, you die. With Jesus, it is the Spirit of of life through Jesus that sets you free. 
And then he says, For God has done, verse 3, what the law weakened by the flesh, by our flesh, could not do. Here's how. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, not a sinner, and for sin, or as an offering for our sin, he condemned sin. So instead of us being condemned now, Jesus kills sin. He puts sin on the witness on the stand and condemns sin in the flesh. Here's the result then, verse 4, in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. This means I can live my life, to use the word here, I can walk, throughout my days, not just sin-free, but guilt-free. If there is anything that feels like a burden on our backs or like we are covered in shackles, it is the burden of guilt. And there are Christians that walk around feeling guilty for their sins. And I'm not talking about someone who's living in ongoing sin. Someone that is as forgiven as it's possible to be forgiven by Jesus. They are as clean as they can be, but they feel guilty. Maybe that's me this morning. And I need the reminder that Jesus sets me free from that. I need to let it go. It's like the shackles aren't locked. I'm just hanging on, and I need to let go. One more. In Psalm 118, verse 5, Jesus not only sets us free from sin and guilt and the law of sin and death, he also can set us free from stress. From stress. Call it worry. Call it pain. Before we go any further, this does not mean a pain-free, problem-free, grief-free life as a Christian. No. But it does mean this. Psalm 118, verse 5. Out of my distress, when we would say my heart felt like a million pieces, in that distress, I called out to the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. And you might, if you like to do research, you might look up that, the word that we get set free from there. Check that out. Or see me afterwards if you want more information on that one. But here's the idea. Is that in Jesus, it is possible to give Him our problems. We may still have to do some things in the the rest of the meantime, to, to take care of some things that we can. And yeah, we're still going to worry sometimes, but we don't have to. Just like we're still going to feel guilty sometimes, but we don't have to. Because Jesus sets us free from sin and even that diabolical daily demon, stress. Because I can go to a God, to a Savior like this, who sets me free. Jesus sets free. We've asked the question, are we free? We've seen the joyful message, Jesus sets free. Let's turn our attention now to being free. Being free. We are free, but not. You knew there was going to be a, a not in there somewhere. Not to sin. Let's turn back to Galatians, this time chapter 5, for this reading. I'm reminded that even in the, in the civil sense, even civil liberties, that does not equal anarchy. Some might want that, or they think they want that. Some might think that's what it means, that I'm free to do whatever I want. Well, we've always had laws in even what is known as a free nation. Someone 
said it this way, that being free means having the right to be wrong, not necessarily the right to do what is wrong. To be free does not mean I do whatever I feel like and there are no consequences. That's not what it means. It means that I am free. As a Christian, spiritually, I am free from those things we discussed and things like that. And on the positive side, I am free to live for Jesus. Not in some, some strict, restricted, rigid, extremely serious way where I've got to be so careful because Jesus is ready to, to punish me. What is that? That becoming a Christian shouldn't feel like, oh no, now I hope I don't mess up. No, it should feel like the chains are broken. But that does not give me then a license to sin. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, it says, You were called to freedom, brothers. And this is still in that context where he's dealing with those that were trying to enslave them back. And so he's telling them, You're free in Jesus, but now the caution, don't let that liberty go to your head. You were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. Well, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, if you abuse one another, if you gossip about one another, if you manipulate one another, if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. So yeah, the Bible tells us not to be spiritual cannibals with our freedom. Not to sin, but to serve. We're in Galatians 5. Turn with me now to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Let's read verse 16. Another time when I encourage you to read on your own the entire, at least this entire paragraph. It might be interesting to see some of the specific issues being addressed when it comes to liberty or freedom. In the middle of that discussion about our relationship to civil governments, he says this, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 16, Live as free people, not using your freedom. Peter sounds a lot like Paul here, Holy Spirit ultimately. Not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil. It's like some Christians might view their freedom in Jesus like a cloak, like a hooded cloak that allows them to get away with whatever they want. I don't have to follow the laws of the land here. But it works in other, other things. I don't have to do this. I'm free in Jesus. I'm a Christian. He says, don't use that as a cover-up for evil, but, as, but living as servant. Keep in mind, that is the word there for slaves. The paradox of Christianity, one of them, if not the paradox, is that I am set free but I'm also, in a way, a slave to the master called Jesus. Now, who my master is and what the, the work is like makes a world of difference. That's a bit of irony here. That I am set free by Jesus not to sin, not to say, well, <laughs> I don't have to do anything. There are no rules, nothing. That would be a mistake. I'm free not to sin, but to serve. Are you free? Whether you are or not today, the good news is that Jesus sets free. And then for those who are free in Jesus today and know it, let's be careful that we know what it means being free. Gary is about to stand up here and lead us in a song. It's an invitation. Call him that because it's an invite for all of us. I'm not saying I'm going to do that this morning, but preachers have gone forward before. So all of us are to respond to this sermon in one way or another is the point. 
It was March 23rd, 1775. St. John's Church, the Second Virginia Convention. Patrick Henry stands before the committee and makes one of the most famous speeches of history since. And the highlight of that is that statement. And if you don't remember anything else in the speech from if you've had high school history, or you might remember that statement. The ultimatum, give me liberty or give me death. How about as a Christian we take that and say, give me life with Christ. That's what I want. And when I have that, I'll have liberty. And if I don't have Jesus, all I have left in the end is death. Freedom as we stand together and sing.